Hello and thank you for attending this webinar I'm running today on simple safety laser scanner setup. Uh, what the webinar will do hopefully is run through the simple setup of a Nanoscan 3 by SICK. So the Nanoscan 3 is a safety laser scanner, it's actually not shown on this picture. And as we're going through the programming of it, I'll be breaking out and hopefully giving you some guidance and talking about common mistakes that people make when programming a scanner and any tips and tricks that I think are relevant. So it's a brief agenda. It's going to be an introduction of myself, some slides on the technology of safety laser scanners. I'll also physically show you the Nanoscan 3 demo case, which I have in front of me. And then I'll just introduce a simple example of an AGV and we'll program a virtual device in the software tool and then transfer it down to the scanner and then see where we go. So first of all, I do apologize, I am running this from home. So if you do hear two small children in the background, I uh, apologize in advance for that, but I think we're all in a similar position. So there's some information on myself. My name is Martin Kidman. I've been at SICK for seven and a half years now and built up a wealth of experience with the SICK safety laser scanner range both from a technical support point of view through to new applications and also the introduction of new products throughout the last seven years. But I've also worked for competitors too, so I have over 10 years experience in safety laser scanner technology. I'm also a functional safety engineer and able to actually perform as a trainer as well to be a certified functional safety application expert at TVSAR. Okay. So safety laser techno technology, um, it's described as an active optoelectronic protective device responsive to diffuse reflections. So what does that mean? What that means is that you have a transmitter in the scanner, which sends out a pulse of light. It will hit an object or not and come back. And then based on the speed of light, uh, we can calculate how far away that object is from the scanner. It's a type three device. Uh, which means that it can be used in safety related part of control systems up to PLD SIL2. And it's type 3 because it's constructed according to IEC 61496. So if, for example, you needed a device to operate in a PLE system, SIL3, you wouldn't be able to use a scanner, you'd have to go to an alternative technology, such as a safety light curtain, for example, which can be a type 4 or a type 2 device. So type 4 will enable PLE. SIL3 type 2 will enable PLC SIL1. So it uses the time of flight principle, which I've just explained, and yeah, I don't need to tell you about the speed of light, so that's the equation, how it works out. So it's not just one measurement that the scanner makes, because internally a mirror spins this beam around um, by 360 degrees. So you can actually build up a profile, a two dimensional profile of the area and contour around the scanner. You'll never get a complete 360 degrees because at the back of scanners you'll have a reflective and an opaque surface which the scanner has to see on every revolution to calibrate and also achieve high levels of safety. So currently at SICK we provide units that can do up to 275 degrees angle and depending on which scanner you use uh, that angle will change and the range is how far away it can safely detect a person and we have a number of different ranges as well. So currently SICK have seven different designs and here are some pictures of the internal workings of them. So they're all based on time of flight. Um, so it sends the beam out, reflects it back in, but with the micro scan and nano scan and outdoor scan, which are quite new, we have the additional algorithm on top of the time of flight called safe HDDM and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, it just gives you a more robust sensing uh, technology. So in order to program a scanner we need to draw in fields to switch outputs off and on. We also need to uh, select different um, parameters like multiple sampling and reference contours etc and we'll go through that too. So you need to have a dedicated software tool provided by the manufacturer. So SICK historically used to have a software tool called CDS if you're familiar. It stands for Configuration Diagnostics Software and now we have a new software called Safety Designer and that's what all new products will be in and in that you can program various devices. So if you do buy a third party scanner 
they should be providing you with a tool in order to, to program that scanner. So let's have a look at the nanoscan. So to demonstrate setting up a safety laser scanner, today I'm going to use the nanoscan 3 which is this device here. So it's sat on a demonstration case and this is what we would normally take to customers to highlight the features and benefits of the nanoscan and also allow customers to test safety laser scanners in real live applications. It has some buttons and features on the box so you can reset the device, you can switch field sets using this button and we also have a controller which can simulate a speed input and you can speed that up and slow that down. And this is if you had uh, safety encoders, for example, on an AGV, and you wanted to switch between field sets based on the speed of the AGV, so you can make them bigger and larger as you increase and decrease speed. The Nanoscan has a memory plug on the back, which stores all the data, and we have a port on the front, which you can connect to configure the device, um, which you can see at the back on the laptop. I currently have my device connected to our configuration software called Safety Designer, which I'll be demonstrating, and you can see the live data. It also has an Ethernet IP interface, and this is for diagnostics on this device, uh, and it's really useful as you can send lots of diagnostics over that. And one example of how you could utilize this is I have my iPad and I've set up a wireless communication with the nanoscan so you can also see on this GUI uh, the live data remotely on a iPad and that could also be used with any smartphone or PC or PLC. So the nanoscan is the smallest unit on the market at just 80 millimeters high and it will give you about a 100 millimeter square footprint on, on the device. It gives you 3 meters in a protective field and uh, 10 meters in a warning field. If you do need a device with a, a, a larger range then you can move to this guy's big brother which is situated here, that's the micro scan and this can offer you up to 9 meters in a protective field and 64 meters in a, in a warning field. This is actually the safety over Ethernet IP version of micro scan so there's no local I.O. this would just sit on a safety network uh, but this comes in Profisafe, uh, Remote I.O., uh, Ethernet IP and, and Hardwired. And then we have here uh, the Outdoor Scanner, uh, which is the only one in the world. Uh, so it's a device based on the same technology, um, but you can use Outdoor and it's certified for outdoor use. So the Nanoscan will give you a 275 degree field of view, which all of the units does. Uh, and that's simulated on the top of each device with these ridges which can give you a good idea of the coverage that you'll get. They're all based on time of flight technology uh, however they're extremely resistant to light, dust and dirt and that's thanks to the onboard technology called Safe HDDM which is high definition distance measurement and that's a sick technology so the device pumps out about 90,000 uh, beams every revolution to give you a really high precision measurement data and you can get that on your remote Ethernet IP as well. The, the device itself has uh, some visible LEDs which are viewable from all different angles and you can see these on the top here and this will give you indications of the warning field, the protective field, whether the device is dirty or not and you also have an LCD on the front which can give you lots of additional information as well. So, what we'll do is we'll switch back to the screen and we'll start going through a configuration. The example that we are going to look at is an AGV, so it hasn't got four scanners on which this one has. We're just going to assume it's got one scanner on the front, a nanoscan, and we're not going to go into the details of 13855 on how to calculate the protective field length. Um, nothing like that. If you are interested, if you go to sick.com or if you're a user of LinkedIn, you can either download the six steps to a safe machine from sick and we have lots of videos on there. Uh, if you're in LinkedIn, feel free to add myself and I regularly write articles on these subjects. So what size protector field and how to calculate it. Uh, an article similar to this about the seven sins of safety laser scanners. And this is the um, the equation that you need to use in order to calculate the field. And that involves the stopping distance, uh, the supplement, 
uh, any supplements reflected it, it's it's a long equation which the operating instructions have and there's there's also advice elsewhere to to look at that however what we're going to assume is that we need a field set one field set and we're going to draw in a protective field of two meters by two meters with the scanner in the middle and then we're going to draw in a warning field just one of them four meters by four meters we're going to leave the resolution at 70 millimeters and we're going to set the multiple sampling to times four and I'll talk about more on this when we get to the section where we have to configure it um, as I say we're not taking into account the breaking distance at the moment and the distance because we're just going to assume we need a two by two meter protective field so let's open the software in order to demonstrate how to program a nanoscan 3 I'll be using the software package safety designer by sick so double click that this is a software package that can be used to configure lots of different uh, sick devices such as a uh, flexisoft safety controller uh, our various safety laser scanners and safety encoders etc so looking at this screen if you were connected to a device you could just click search for devices and it would find it and then you could upload the program however we're going to run a new project because we're not going to connect to the demo case at the moment we're going to create a virtual configuration and then transfer it down to that device so when you run a project you get this screen and as you can see you have settings through to configuration connections and report and generally you'll move from left to right throughout the course of a project so there's lots of stuff at the top menus connections settings uh, but really you're most interested in this section here so under settings you can um, add the name of the user for example you can uh, add the application name and any other information that you'd like to put in there you can add there there's also the facility if you're setting up a, a, a safety over a network system of setting the IP systems the network number for SIP safety and you have some other details there however we're going to move into configuration so in the configuration page you have the main working area on the left and then you have the device catalog on the right so if you were searching it would come up here however we're not going to so there is a list of sick configurable devices that are pre-written if you are connecting to a third party device or adding for example a robot with SIP safety enabled to a SIP safety master by sick then you could use the generic Ethernet IP SIP safety device however we're just going to be programming a st standalone unit the nanoscan so if you drag that over into the left hand screen you can see that that appears there and then you can configure it if you were running a um, SIP safety network or as we call it FE Pro then if you click the IP icon on the left uh, let me just choose this we're working with a Pro with Ethernet connection you can connect connect to this icon and this will give you an overview of the complete network so you'd likely have a CPU with an FE Pro master and then a number of devices hanging off that such as um, I don't know an Ethernet microscan a, a robot and maybe some other devices okay so this has just appeared on the other screen if this doesn't appear you can also click this and then click configure however I'm going to drag this over so if we look at the overview this gives you lots of information about the device itself type codes uh, connections and you can see that some things aren't available because we're not physically connected such as checksums and the system status for example but if you were connected you'd see all this and also you would see a live scan of what the data the scanner can see and also an indication of what the LCD is displaying as well so let's jump to configuration so under configuration you have lots of options again the first option is for IP addresses and also we have uh, things if you taking a readout but really it's the icons in blue and the identification that is the most important for us here so under identification again you can put in some information from your application such as the project name application name if you have an image of the application you can upload it there and then you click next application 
So you choose stationary or mobile. So we're going to choose mobile. And the reason you choose mobile is because in stationary, uh, there's a there's a an algorithm that runs in the scanner that if it can't see a reflection in a certain quadrant for a certain amount of time, it will trip. So if you're stationary, usually this will be indoors because you can't use scanners generally outside. However, if you have a mobile application, it's likely that you may be driving around and maybe you go to a doorway where you can see out into a field, for example, and it might stop. And you might need uh, this check to actually last longer where it can't see a particular reflection. So we choose mobile. We're going to work in English, but you can choose other languages. If you're mounting the scanner upside down, obviously you can flip the screen. So we'll just leave that. And then we go to monitoring plane. Okay, so there's some options that you can choose here. So you can name it monitoring plane. You can choose either area protection, access protection, or hazardous point protection. If you were choosing access protection, the, the little picture here shows you what that means. So that's like a uh, like a light curtain basically, but it's a scanner for vertical access protection and if you did that you'd need to ac actually uh, enable reference contour monitoring so you'd have to set a date and point where the scanner can permanently see this and this is just in case it vibrates out of position or somebody actually tries to tilt the scanner which would mean that the the protective field would create a an access underneath it uh, so you need to set that reference contour monitoring the same would be for hazardous point protection so this could be where I don't know, you, you've, you're reaching in with your arm instead of actually walking through. But we're going to leave it on hazardous area protection because we're looking horizontally in front of an AGV and we don't need reference contour monitoring. Then you have the option here for choosing different resolutions. So by default it's gone to 70. However, you can change this right the way down to 20. If we look at this value here, we have a 3 meter protective field for the nanoscan. However, if you change this, the contour, uh, sorry, the resolution, your protective field will actually reduce. And the reason for that is that the beams that come out of a scanner actually get further and further apart the further they, the further they travel. So that has a direct consequence of the maximum size object, or the, sorry, the minimum size object that the scanner can detect. So to explain that, I'm just going to flip to a couple of slides. So on this screen, uh, we can see uh, a simulation of what the beams are doing on a scanner. So they're firing out one after the other. So as you can see, the beams get further and further apart, the farther they are. So with a high resolution, um, a low number uh, setting such as 20 millimeters, you're more likely to detect an arm or leg quicker than you are if you have a high, a low resolution um, setting so a higher number such as 70 or 150 millimeters and the reason that you choose a particular resolution actually um, is related to the size of the field that you actually need in the protective field so this is the general equation uh, from 13855 which is the harmonized standard for uh, designing uh, protect mounting protective devices and it's s equals k times t plus c so k is the approach speed of a body now if it was a stationary machine that would be 1.6 meters per second walking or 2 meters per second reaching in but if it's on an AGV it's assumed that the person would stand still so it's actually the speed of the AGV and then you have T which is the total stopping time or rundown time and that's the response of the AGV the response of the light care and the braking system etc and you can do that with a stop time test and then C is the uh, the distance representing how far into the hazardous area you've approached and the resolution directly affects that value C. So if you had 14 millimeters for example that value would be zero but if you start getting bigger numbers then the, the, the protective field needs to be larger as well. Okay, right, let's go back to the tool. So we're back on our configuration tool and we shall leave the resolution on 70 millimeters because leg detection is fine for AGVs and we want to utilize the total 3 meter protective field. So the next thing you, you, you can choose is the multiple sampling value 
and if you click this box you can see that this can be increased up to 16 times. So what the multiple sampling value is, is it's on a safety laser scanner, uh, by default out of the box, a sick device anyway, um, the device has to, the, the laser beam has to see something at the same distance and the same angle twice in a row before it trips for redundancy. And you can actually increase this value so it needs to see it three times or four times or five times. And what this can do is increase availability. So you can ignore things like dust or spurious trips. However, by increasing this value, if you look at the response time of the OSSDs, at the moment on times two it's 70 millimeters. But as you increase this value, the response time changes. So if you go from two to three, it jumps to 100. So it's 30 milliseconds for every additional scan that you add. So 130 for four, all the way up to 490 milliseconds. Now this is great for increasing availability. However, as you increase this response time, it means your scanner is taking longer to see something. And what this has a direct impact on is the size of the protector field that is required uh, because the scanner needs to see something quicker because it takes longer to react. So out of the box, some scanners are actually programmed to have quite a big response time and you need to take note of that. And what we say is that a protective field needs to be um, as small as possible but as large as required. So you have to be very careful when changing this multiple sampling value. So if we just take a look at the, the recommended um, values for the nano scan. Um, you can see that for stationary and clean environments or vertical we just leave it on times two which gives you a really fast response however in mobile applications because you may have uh, vibrations or dust flying up as the AGV travels along we recommend to increase it to four um, to give it a higher availability and in stationary environments where you've got dust or additional um, problems you can increase it to times eight now because the nanoscan actually has the safe HDDM on board, the high definition distance measurement, this is actually a really robust um, sensing principle. You can see more of that on YouTube or at sick.com. So actually what this means is because it's got a robust sensing principle, you don't have to increase this value as much as you would on other devices. So you can keep that response time quite low which enables you to keep your uh, protective field nice and tight. So actually, if you're looking at it, the footprint of the AGV isn't the AGV, it's the AGV plus the protective field. So the smaller you can keep this protective field, the less likely you're gonna have the AGV stopping all the time because of trips. And conversely, if it's a stationary ma machine, if you have a low multiple sampling rate, your protective field can be tucked in so people walking past won't trip it and you don't need to protect with fences, etc. So we're going to leave this on times four, which gives 130 milliseconds, which is still good, but this will have a direct impact on our uh, protective field S equals K times T plus C. So that's the monitoring plane. The next thing we're going to configure is actually the fields. And this is where you start programming uh, the actual protective fields. Now before we do this, one important thing is to talk about the different field types because there are more than one. I've already mentioned protective field but we have warning, contour, etc. And to do that I will just flip back to my presentation. Okay, so it's quite important that you understand the difference between fields and field sets. So a scanner can have a number of different types of field. So I've been talking quite a lot about the protective field. So this is the field that you configure which can be used in applications up to performance level D or SIL2. This will give you a safety field. But we also have warning fields that you can draw on a scanner as well. And these are non-safe fields and could be used for other purposes such as um, signaling an AGV to slow down and then that inherently reduces the protective field because you've got speed feedback on the AGV. Or it could be used to uh, warn people if they're getting too close to the protective field for example and it's generally that the warning fields are normally larger than the protective field and these warning fields can on the nanoscan do up to 10 meters but 64 meters on an S3000. 
but obviously the resolution gets smaller the further away so you can't use the warning field in safety applications then we have a reference contour field and this would be if you're using a scanner in a vertical application for example it can be used in horizontal as well and this would be to detect uh, a, a static object like the floor for example so that if the scanner was tilted away or it moved from position uh, you've got a sort of datum point for the scanner and then we have which is quite unique to SICK actually a contour detection field so this is actually a field that can safely detect something on the protector field anything within this red field will switch the device off whereas anything in the blue field on this will switch the contour detection field either on or off whichever you choose to 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 signal that however you have to be very careful if you're using its contour detection to ensure that it's fail safe because if you had an object in the red space here then you'd never detect anything in the blue because you'll create a shadow so it could be for example in a robot cell you're safely detecting that the door is shut um, and that this area is free so you choose the fields that you require and then you construct a field set and a field set is just a number of fields of any type contained in a field set so here are some examples on this screen so field set one we actually have four protective fields in that field set and in field set two we have a protective field two warning fields and a contour detection field and what you would do is you'd signal to the scanner via inputs which particular field set is active at a particular point in time and we'll see that when we talk about cases on the next couple of slides however with the um, SICK devices we can have a maximum depending on which device you choose up to eight fields in a particular field set and we can have up to 128 field sets in a scanner also uh, what we can also do is um, using safe communication look at all of those fields in a particular field set at any point in time and this is called simultaneous field evaluation so if you had eight protective fields in a field set and you were communicating to the scanner using safety over Ethernet IP for example using the SICK FlexiSoft in the SICK FlexiSoft when you've chosen that field set you can see all of those protective fields at once so you've turned your single scanner into a scanner with eight outputs essentially so you've got eight scanners and by communicating in this way you can actually do really complex logic uh, with this safe information so things like sequence monitoring or if it's in a vertical application you can do two fields protective fields and allow access to one side of a robot when it's on the left and then allow access to the other side of the robot when it's on the right so you can do quite complex uh, automation with this simultaneous field evaluation uh, so yeah up to eight fields in a field set and 128 field sets allowed on a scanner so we'll go back to the um, nanoscan configuration so back to fields so what we need to do is set up a 2 meter by 2 meter protector field and a 2 meter by 2 meter warning field so if we look on the right here we have these field sets and fields and then down the bottom we have different options for each individual field type so if we select field one and we want that to be a warning protective field and then you have various tools here which you can use to draw different types of field so I'm just going to draw it quite loosely in a rectangle and it's going to be um, two meters by two meters so we have the actual distances here at the top and down the left and we also have a cursor on the bottom right so it's going to be one meter left and one meter right up to two meters so there's two meters and there's our two meter by two meter protective field when you've drawn this device you can um, edit the individual coordinates if you want to be really exact and there's also other drawing tools here um, you can zoom in and out which I've just done fit to screen and also you can add a background image if you need to do that um, so that's our 
protect the field we're going to add a field to the field set and then protect field 2 is going to be a warning field and also you can see here that you can increase and decrease the multiple sampling for individual fields as well to give you a lot more um, availability by being quite precise so 4 meters is going to be 2 meters left and 2 meters right it doesn't have to be exact for demonstration purposes so I'll just make a an approximate approximation here 2 meters by 2 meters and if you did want to individually change those coordinates you could do that here uh, but as I said it doesn't need to be exact okay and if you want to add field set you can do that here and you can delete etc so the next section I'm going to move to is inputs and outputs so because we have a hardwired device and it's not a safety over network we have um, universal IO which we can assign functionality to so by default 3 and 4 are the OSSD pairs you need to power the device obviously and here we're under outputs so we could if we if we wanted to add another set of OSSDs but for this example we don't need that but you can also add various other outputs um, so one of them is contamination so if you wanted an indication of contamination of the screen you could use a universal IO for that and actually just to give you a bit more information on contamination again I'm going to flip back to my presentation so one thing that can affect a safety laser scanner is contamination of the screen that covers the optics so on the right here we have an S300 interior and we have an, a nanoscan on the left and what we do is we, around the base of the unit we have these small retroreflective photocells which actually go through the um, screen hit a, re a, re a reflector and then bounce back and we can monitor the intensity of these photocells around the edge of of the of the screen and by doing this if you get scratches condensation or dirt on the screen we can actually give a pre-warning of contamination so at 20 percent we'll get an output to say it's getting dirty so you can clean it with a lint-free cloth and some anti-static spray because at 30 percent 35 percent it will actually trip so that's how we can uh, help with availability by giving warnings of contamination okay so let's go to inputs and then we have a number of inputs that we can assign to the universal IO as well so IO can be an input or an output and we give you indications next to the pin of what they can be so we have static control inputs and this is if you are switching field sets for example so we only have one field set at the moment um, however I'll give you an example of how you can switch fields in a second we can also add dynamic controls so rather than static and this would be in the form of encoders so if you had two uh, encoders connected to an AGV you could actually take the data from the encoders convert that into speed and then rather than switching field sets based on uh, static IO you can just switch a field set based on speed so for example in slow speeds have a small protective field and then increase that field as it gets faster because as an AGV gets faster it's going to take longer to stop so you need to have a longer field also you have um, EDM so if you normally you'd have a safety PLC or controller and you would perform the contact check back in there but you can actually do this with the scanner itself so it has a, an EDM feedback input and it also has a reset input and on the output you also have a reset required if you want to flash a light however you'd normally do that in the safety PLC and I'm going to assume that we're doing that here we have a sleep mode and restart device if you want to put the device into sleep or you want to reset it so there's lots of different things so let's pretend we have one input and an input is actually made up of two 
wires and that's for safety reasons so input A we've got complementary so if it's in complementary it means that each of the inputs A, B, C and D they have to have complementary inputs so when one's high the other one is low and that's an additional safety check to ensure that um, you have good integrity of them inputs. The more inputs you have so if you added a second input A and B you could have four cases so you can select a field set based on the inputs so for these two inputs you could have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1 so that's four different possibilities for the input so you can choose up to four field sets based on which input is and that would be a case so if you added another static control that's three inputs so that's 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0 so you can actually have eight and then 16 32, 64, etc. So what I'm going to do is put a simple input A, so it's either on or off, and I'm very quickly going to add a additional field set. Now at the moment it doesn't really matter what this looks like, it's just for demonstration purposes, so I'll have one warning field and I will have one protective, uh, so sorry, one protective field and one warning field. So let's just add any any old. So we have field set 1 and field set 2. We have our inputs A and then when we come to monitoring cases this is where we actually set up the logic. So first of all we have to say we are using an input A and here are our field sets over the left. So if we drag our field set 1 onto this cutoff path what we'd like is that the protector field switches the OSSD and the warning field switches a universal output so I'll select one. Okay and we have a little X there and the reason for that is because on inputs and outputs I didn't actually assign UI01 so I will give that a monitoring result so it's pin 5 and if we go back to our monitoring cases you'll see that that's now happy. So here we see if input condition A is high we select field set 1 and you can name that case if you want etc and what I'm going to do is add a monitoring case which will go underneath and I will say to select field set 2 I want A to be low. Now it'll give you an indication if there's an error because you obviously can't choose both field sets with A being high so if you choose A high field set 1 A low field set 2 that's quite happy and the cutoff path the same and you can simulate this in the software so here we have A is low choose A is high and you can switch between the field sets and this is a really useful function if you're working with lots of different field sets which normally on an AGV you would be so on this example we're not so I'll delete that field set so we just have field set 1 and the IO I will remove input A so we have protector field and warning field and then we go back to the cases I just need to delete this case okay with the, the trash can so we have um, no input, turn that off. So we're always looking at protector field and warning field in field set 1 and they will be switching the OSSD and universal output 1. So there's nothing much to simulate here because there's nothing that can change but this again just shows you the cutoff paths for each device. Okay so that's the field sets set up. You also have some additional settings that you can change such as we have a data output which people do use for navigation for example uh, and you can set the up UDP TCP IP and you can select the quadrants and what data you're actually sending out and we have lots of additional information on this if this is what you intend to do and now because we're happy with our configuration we get to actually transferring the project to the physical device okay so what I'm going to do is switch again so we have our scanner plugged in on the port at the front 
and it's connected to our screen via the laptop so you can zoom in there and what we're going to do now is search for the device and then jump to this screen and show you how you can transfer a configuration so we're back in our configuration tool and what we would like to do now is transfer our configuration down to a physical device so in order to do this we go back to our screen here and we need to find a connection to the physical device so click connect and we have found our device there on the right so it's nice and green and that just means that the demo case that I've got has been pre-programmed and there's a verified configuration in there but what we want to do is create a connection between this config and the live device so to do that you just drag across and place it over the top and then we can either upload or transfer so if we uploaded we would read the device's configuration but we want to transfer what we have done down to the device so it's running and it's telling us we have some tasks that are outstanding. So this is the software down the bottom here telling us that there are some things that we need to look at because we haven't completed. So it's quite intuitive that it'll help you um, complete your verification. So it's asking us about starting the device in test mode. So I'll click yes. So we've actually transferred the configuration and it's working the way we like it. But you've got a flashing message on the LCD saying configuration not verified and it's in test mode so if you look at the tasks one will probably be device not verified and the other one is the IP set okay the IP setting so first of all I'll just address this IP setting so this means that the IP setting in our configuration is different to the IP setting in the device so you can either click solve and it take you straight there but I know where it is so configure up the top here we can see that the IP address in our config ends in 12 whereas the IP address in the device ends in 13 so one out so we can either transfer to the device or read from the device so I'll just read from the device because it's quicker so we've updated our configuration to read 13 so that should have got rid of that task and then to verify the device um, if for example we removed the USB plug now and left it it would work but it's not verified so if you lost power and powered up again you'd lose everything all the configuration and actually that's quite a common mistake that people make also on our safety controllers not verifying the device so you need to make sure you verify and validate so click the verify button it gives you a copy of the report which gives you all of the information you can create a PDF with this about the field sets the fields the cases the IO and then you click OK and set the device to verified okay so now that we're connected and it is all happy if we go back into the device the configuration all there we also have diagnostics which you can run whilst you're connected so data recorder this allows you to um, record the live data so there you can see my office um, that's actually the window and uh, that's me if I move around you can see me moving on my desk and you can record this and play it back and you can also um, go to event history now this doesn't have any event history in it because it's a newly configured device but what I'll do I'll just load a file from a previous oops, a previous application and I can show you what this does so the scanner will actually store all previous events and it allows you to go back and investigate why the scanner tripped and um, we find this really useful so there are all our events 1 to 19 on this particular example and if we click through them you can see that you can change which green dot you're highlighting so if I look at okay let's stay on this dot number 8 so if we look over here this is the actual protect field of that device and we can see that the 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 infringement occurred within the protector field so that to me says it's probably not a person but we can scan through and have a look so there we have a spike really small object there it's carrying on through and then it disappears 
So that's probably dust or a particle or a dandelion or something like that. If we try and look at one of these, which you can see will be at the perimeter of the um, scan field, so that's 13. Here you can go through and that you can see as a person. So there's two typical uh, scans that you'd see of a person's legs and as you can see when they're walking towards it they've infringed the, the scan field. If I can find any more, six, eight, so that's here, that's likely dust. Scan through, there you go, yep. And number two, straight away you can see there that's probably a person. So move them and you can see that the legs moving forwards. That's the right leg moving forward and then the left leg would have followed. So this is an excellent tool for helping you work out what the infringement was. If you go to the event table, it gives you all the timestamps, dates, and actually how long that the infringement occurred for. So these values here, two, five, seven, 2,267 scans. So that's not likely to be dust, that's likely to be something moving into the field. Uh, so you can really whittle this down. And actually, another useful thing is we currently had on this application a multiple sampling of two. So we could have eliminated some of these trips if we'd have increased our multiple sampling to four or five. Um, because we know how long the infringement occurred for. But remember, increasing this multiple sampling increases your response time, which affects your protective field size. So you have to be careful there. Then we have finally the message history, and this gives you all the historic messages saved in a device about um, sort of problems about uh, switching field or case switching or faults in the device, etc. So that's a really, really useful tool. Uh, for when you're live and then there we have the report again um, which we saw when we verified and validated so on verification and validation so that's really the scanner programmed so I'll just talk about verification and validation as well so as part of the uh, safety lifecycle function, you need to consider verif verification and validation of a safety laser scanner installation. And it's quite an important step. So in order to help you with that, we can provide you with uh, the Systema library for all of our SICK devices to help you calculate uh, performance levels, etc. We can also advise on applications pre-application. We also have services where we can do stop time tests and assist with risk assessment. And in the operating instructions, you'll also find a checklist for commissioning, um, which you can find quite useful too. But you should be developing a validation plan and it should be available to everybody within the project. And an example of a validation test could be uh, on an AGV to put a box on the floor and then maybe drive the AGV as fast as you can towards the box and make sure it doesn't hit it. That could be a validation test. So just on some other mistakes that we've seen or I've seen in, in, in the field. So thinking about safety last and this can become quite expensive. So somebody's built a robot cell and then thought, right, where am I going to stick this scanner? And what happens normally is that you find that it's difficult to mount the scanner in a particular position. You end up with blind spots where the scanner can't see, so you have to add additional scanners. And scanners aren't cheap, so that can become quite expensive. Um, so the best thing to do is think about the scanner at the same time as designing your, your working area. Ensure you know where it's going to be mounted and what it can and can't see. Another uh, mistake we've seen is for using non-safe inputs to switch a field set. So switching between field sets on a safety laser scanner is actually a safety function, a mode selection safety function. So the integrity of the safety of that circuit needs to be the same as the device itself. So you essentially need a performance level D SIL2 switching field input in order to safely choose the correct field set. So for example, again, on an AGV, if you accidentally choose a small field whilst you're going really fast, that could have quite dire consequences because the AGV won't stop quick enough in order to 
uh, stop from impacting somebody. Another problem we've seen is people programming uh, the protector field too close to a surrounding contour. So because scanners are based on infrared light, there will be error. And depending on the scanner that you use, the error can change from scanner to scanner. So for example, our S3000s have uh, a tolerance of about 100 millimeters. Whereas our nanoscan and microscan have a tolerance of about 65, well, of 65 millimeters. So you need to ensure that you leave that much from the wall, otherwise you'll have constant trips um, from it detecting the wall with this error. If you have a resolution such that uh, you can't see a person around this wall, so if you have a 100 millimeter tolerance and you're not going to see a 70 millimeter leg, then you'd need to consider additional uh, methods of uh, overcoming that, so such as plates or, or increasing the wall above the scan field so that you can't stand in that position. So that is an overview of safety laser scanners. It's a big subject to try and squeeze into such a short time, but thanks for your attention and um, hopefully you've found this quite interesting. So now we shall go to some questions.